Donna uh, back for the second of her lectures on uh, the universe and big data, and I'll let her uh, proceed. Thanks, Aviana. All right. Uh, well, hello, everybody. It's nice to be back. So let's see what we are going to talk about today. This is part two of our journey through uh, big universe and big data in astrophysics and this is a little bit about the um, like what today's session uh, look like as usual feel free to use video i think uh, uh, we were fairly successful uh, in uh, using uh, the chat um, yesterday so i think we can uh, continue to do the same uh, if it works for you guys um, and uh, uh, i like to start uh, with, uh, you know, like going back to some of the questions from yesterday and see if I can answer a few more of those. Uh, then you'll have some like blah, blah, blah from me um, for about 35 minutes. Then we have a little break as usual and then a bit more blah, blah. And I'm going to try to leave quite a bit of time at the end uh, to answer questions. And, you know, in this case, I feel like, you know, feel free to ask questions about the topics of the lectures of both days, but also, you know, if you have something uh, more general about, uh, you know, life as a scientist, or, you know, you're curious about a uh, career path in astronomy and astrophysics, I'll be, you know, I'd also be happy to answer those types of questions. So, um, these are some of the questions that I, uh, like, marked down from yesterday as unsolved. And so I'm going to try to go more or less in chronological order. So the first one from Yanis was, um, if I understand the question correctly, actually, uh, was at what decimal point will we need to know the accuracy of our distances to be able to detect the change in distances in galaxy within, say, an exposure time of 10 years? So the way I interpreted this is, can we actually get ever to the level of accuracy uh, to detect the change in the distance of a galaxy, let's say, you know, like in a period of 10 years, if, you know, we were willing to observe for the entire time. And it wasn't uh, a simple question. So let's see if I can share, uh, yeah, this other screen. Are you now seeing this other screen that looks like a notebook, hopefully? Yes? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, and so, so I was trying to answer this question. I was thinking, okay, um, the way we measure distances in most cases is through redshift. So, you know, uh, the first part, I think, of these questions was about, uh, you know, what is the change, let's say, in redshift in a galaxy? And, you know, we need to place the galaxy somewhere to understand what the change would be. So I'm gonna say, you know, from a galaxy that is like about uh, one billion light years away, or you know, if you will, which is observed about one billion years in the past. And so after 10 years, what will be? Uh, so its redshift is about 0.33, and then I ask, okay, after 10 years, you know, how much would have the redshift of this galaxy changed? And so to do so, I use some of these routines, like in AstroPy, which is uh, one of the uh, I guess like data analysis packages in Python for astronomy. Uh, it has like a cosmology. Um, I can think of the word, um, I guess like package. And uh, from that, we can say, okay, let's assume that we have like a flat lambda CDM universe, which means like flat geometry, cold dark matter and a cosmological constant. And we can assume that the values of the different um, constants, so, you know, like the matter and energy content, the value of the Hubble constant and so on, are fixed by the results of some experiment, in this case, W9. Uh, and so I said, okay, uh, let's calculate the redshift of the galaxy at the age of 10 uh, giga years. Actually, I apologize. This is a galaxy that is seen as an age of 10 giga years, which means like about 4 billion years in the past. And then at the same age plus 10 years. You can see that the difference between, you know, the ratio is about 0.33, as I was saying, the relative difference, yes, library, <laughs> thanks. Yes, everything is open source, yeah. 
Um, and so the relative difference between these, uh, between the redshift and the redshift with like 10 years added to that is very tiny, right? It's about like three parts in 10 to the negative 10. So can we ever measure redshift with this uh, precision? Well, um, for the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which is, as we know, one of the patches of the sky for which we had the highest quality data, uh, the exposure time is quite a bit less than, you know, like the 10 years that Yanis was proposing. It's more like, you know, two million seconds. But um, the redshift, even the spectroscopic one, are known with not more than three significant digits. The problem here is that the accuracy of this measurement is not limited by how much time we spend observing the source, but by the fact that when we measure redshift, and you know, hopefully this is like large enough on your screen, I'm gonna see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Like, you know, when we measure redshift, like the best things that we could do is to identify some emission lines in the spectrum of a galaxy. And then, you know, like if we want to do this a little bit better and we zoom in, we see that we actually have line profiles and we fit those to, you know, like the best possible location. And this is how we determine redshift. And we are never going to be able to have the location down with that amount of precision. So I feel like here we are not dominated by statistical error, we are dominated by systematic error, which is the fact that even in the lab, it's hard to give the location of emission lines with like, you know, 10 significant digits. And then, you know, additionally, when we measure this in a spectrum, there are other confounding effects. So the problem here is not, can we take data good enough, but systematics are always going to be a floor that prevents us from doing so. Anyway, just for fun, because at this point I was invested in this problem, I assume that, okay, if we assume that, you know, like the relative error uh, that uh, we have currently on redshift is about 10 to the negative three, and what we decide is 10 to the negative 10 to have a three sigma detection, right? You know, a signal to noise of three, let's say. And then the signal to noise in general scales with the square root of the observing time. If you're assuming that, you know, like having, um, a linear increase in observing time gives you a linear increase in the number of photons. And if you assume that, you know, like the error is Poisson, so one over square root of n. However, this is not really fair because we're not looking at the signal to noise in a quantity that's directly measured, but in a quantity that is inferred, like redshift. So, you know, like I'm also sort of getting rid of this part, but let's assume that this is the case. So we need to improve by a factor of 10 to the negative, or 10 to the seven which means in signal to noise or in observing time, we need to improve by a factor of 10 to the 14. And so uh, if we two times 10 to the six seconds of observation, which is what we have now in the Hubble ultra deep field, uh, we have a relative precision of 10 to the negative three, we multiply this by 10 to the 14, which is about 10 to the 20 seconds, which is about three trillion years. And so even if systematics uh, weren't uh, you know, uh, a problem, even if we could, you know, somehow get rid of systematics, I would think still this would be like prohibitive as an observation. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go back now to other questions. Hopefully that was, you know, somewhat entertaining, if not helpful. Then Amir had a question about um, uh, our uh, neural network for the digit recognition algorithm. And he was asking if I could show some cases that uh, the machine predicted wrong. Um, so uh, let's see, let's go back to that. And for this, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to once again, um, let's see. See if I can show you this. Okay, not going to reconnect, but I'm just going to show you. So, are you hopefully now seeing the uh, notebook about the digits dataset? Yes. Thank you. Okay. 
So if you remember uh, yesterday, you know, like we train our neural network and then we were looking at some random examples. And in general, just because this neural network has an accuracy of 99%, um, then uh, it was kind of hard to find uh, predictions that were uh, incorrect. But so here what I did is just like, you know, I added a few uh, cells at the end of the notebooks first by like saving the prediction. And in this case, you can see that what we are saving is uh, the predictions that a certain objects belong to one of the 10 possible outputs. And so actually the maximum of that gives us the most likely prediction. And so I'm now saving just for the first 1000 objects in the test set, uh, what the, you know, like class like prediction is. So this would be like a number from zero to nine, indicating like a predicted value uh, predicted digit of zero to nine. And then I also saved in a similar manner, the true one. And then I created an array that has the differences, actually the indexes of the incorrect predictions. And in this case, actually for this iteration, oh wow, this neural network, this iteration was actually, yeah, even better than the one of yesterday, just like 0.92% error rate. So in this first 1000 objects, there were just nine, they were classified incorrectly. And you can see uh, what they are here. And I added as a title of this plot, what was like the true value and the predicted one. And so you can see that this is a tree that was predicted to be a five. And in this case, I would say like for a human, this is more of a tree than a five. If anything, I would imagine, okay, getting confused with an eight. The second one is also interesting. It's a four that the network is interpreting as predicting as a nine. The third case is a four that the network is predicting as a two. And then this is like a five that the network is reading as a three. And you can see, you know, like a couple of other one. And in many cases, you can see the four, at least in this, like, you know, this is only like 10% of the test set. So, you know, we can't really trust any statistics that we see here. But four seems to be something that at least a couple of times is mistaken for a nine. And probably it's because uh, this, way of writing a four is a little less common, right? You know, we're here like the line is not complete. Okay, so, you know, I said that I will post this somewhere. I still haven't figured it out. Uh, how did you encode it? Um, uh, Yanis, I'm not sure I understand your question. How did you encode the knowledge domain? The fact that they were digits, you mean? Yes. Remember yesterday there was a question uh, about if this looks like a Q, if it's a letter, or if it's a digit, and you said that you encode the no, you in, incorporate a knowledge domain in the beginning, and I was wondering how do you do that, and how could you possibly expand it? Yes, uh, I think the way that this happens is that you know when you give training data, you also provide the labels for uh, the training set. And if those labels are digits of zero to nine, that the network will know that all it can output is these. So it will, know, it will not know anything about letters or you know, like other possibilities. It will just say, okay, you know, all you're showing me are you know, like numbers zero to nine. And so this is what I will output. Does it make sense? Okay, great. Now let's see, I'm gonna do another one of these like slightly awkward uh, different sharing. Okay, so John had two questions. One is for some of these galaxy related tests that use ML4, how long does it usually take to code up a reasonable prototype? And so this one I'm actually, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm lying, I'm not gonna <laughs> um, explain it and I'm not gonna answer it. But uh, as I mentioned, I'm gonna try to comment a little bit on this later when we talk about uh, the example with star formation histories with machine learning that we will see today. And also was asking about resources for a beginner. And I think Maria also had a similar question. So give me a second in the next slides, I'll show you some resources. Uh, Irsad had a question about what methods can be used if there, are so, so there is so much noise that brings the number, like the numbers become blurry or can't be seen clearly. Well, I guess, you know, of course there is sort of like, you know, limiting threshold, you know, like a limiting amount of noise uh, um, in which, you know, even humans become uh, 
um, like, you know, are not able to recognize what's written. And, you know, in some cases, actually, machines can get better than humans in some tasks. So I think that there are a few ways in which you can improve on performance. One is providing a larger or just more diverse training set. So, you know, like there are some diagnostics that one can use to say, okay, if my machine is not improving anymore, um, I could try, you know, to understand what cases it's getting wrong. And I could try to enlarge the training sample of objects that are similar to those problematic cases. So this could be a way. And then, I mean, like, you know, more often this can be done in a, as a pre-processing step. So for example, you know, you could decide to do cleanup of the training data and maybe only provide training examples that are really clean. And, you know, it's possible that this could help in the sense that uh, you can uh, spare the machine from learning noise. But I don't feel like there's like an answer that can fit all just because, you know, like when data are noisy, it's really, I feel like, you know, this is where the real digging begins. And this is also when the knowledge of the domain really matters. Uh, I had a question actually on the other topic, which was from Leonid about, you know, like, uh, could the expansion of the universe be related to anti-gravity? And actually I had a slide on this yesterday that I didn't have time to show. But the problem with anti-gravity is that, you know, it sounds perfect on paper, because you feel like, hey, you know, like we know that gravity is an attractive force, we're trying to do the opposite, and we know that things like the electromagnetic force comes with like, you know, a negative and a positive. So why couldn't this just be anti-gravity? But the problem is that, in general, when we think about forces, forces have carriers, and so in some sense, uh, anti-gravity would suppose, you know, like the strength of this anti-gravity, in whatever form we can imagine this, uh, we need to depend on some property, for example, mass, right, and distance. While in this case, we don't see dark energy or, you know, like whatever it is, like this type of interaction as depending on any of this variable, right? So like it's like the amount of dark energy measured as a um, function of environment or density or any other properties you can think of is still basically constant. And so this makes it very difficult, very different from any of the other force because, you know, like usually there is some property that you can associate as, you know, uh, an expression of the strength of such force. So that's why anti-gravity doesn't work. And then I guess like after this, I think I wanted to answer like John and Maria about resources. So uh, I have like a few examples here. The first two are just like, you know, if you're interested in learning machine learning, uh, these are like two Coursera courses. And, you know, of course there are like a million of these out there, but I put these because I personally took both of them and I enjoy them a lot. So the first one is like the really classic uh, machine learning course by Andrew Eng. And, um, you know, it's, it's an ancient course, actually, I took it uh, several years ago when he was still like in MATLAB, uh, but now you have several versions and, you know, actually, I think like the videos and the exercise are also available for free on GitHub if you just look for it. And the second is uh, a more advanced course. In fact, it's the first in uh, one of these like advanced specializations. And I took it less than a year ago. This was uh, one of my sabbatical projects was to learn more about the fundamentals of deep learning. And this is, it's a course from like the Russian school, Russian school of economics. So, you know, like not necessarily for physicists, but uh, I found that I had a lot of rigor and I found myself, you know, like multiplying matrices by hand, which I hadn't done for a long time. So I found that it was really helpful if you are you know, already a little bit more advanced. Then for physics, um, I think, uh, hopefully, David uh, from last week has introduced already this review and he's one of the authors and I feel like it's really good because uh, associated to the review you also can find exercises in the form of Python notebooks. So again, I'm going to do the Sherry Sherry and change. And so you can see here that this is like, you know, the web page that is associated to the review. And uh, by the way, the digits data set is one of those that is used, but the other two are more like, you know, physics oriented. And so there are like a bunch of notebooks for different algorithms that 
um, I think are a really good resource. Um, then what else? Uh, and uh, I put here another review of applications of machine learning in physics that are a bit more recent from last year and also I think very good. And then, oops, sorry, for uh, specific to astronomy, well, AstroML is another library that is actually associated to an excellent textbook. Um, I will show it to you. Here we go. And so you can see that this is like a library that was created for machine learning and data mining in astronomy. And the textbook is a gradual level textbook uh, by Evis told It's really well done. Um, it's also expensive. Uh, but I feel like, you know, like every single figure in the textbook has like public code that is available here. And there are a lot of like, you know, several like data sets and examples, and these are all available uh, for free. So, you know, if you're in particular interested in astronomy, I think that this is a really nice resource. And finally, I guess like just for a little bit of self promotion. I thought um, I lost track of what I'm sharing. Let me see. Uh, last year, I taught a summer school uh, in like machine learning cross astronomy at the Center of Computational Astrophysics of the Flatiron Institute in New York. And so, all these materials is now free on GitHub, and it won't be for long. And the reason for this is that I'm writing a textbook and of course like a lot of this material will sort of be translated into textbooks. So I think like at some point the editor, uh, like the publisher would probably, you know, like tell me to be careful with this. But for now, you know, like all the lectures are available and all the material is available. And you can see like, you know, the different like outline for different days. And they also had video lectures so you can see like the link at the bottom if you want you can also use that um, and yeah so i think that's it for this part um, any questions okay all right, so I'm going to, uh, you're very welcome guys. So I'm going to uh, get started. You know, you see like I'm already almost 10 minutes late on my schedule uh, about the content of today, which is how can we get information about galaxies uh, using Bayesian inference and machine learning. So, oops. okay. So the first question is uh, what? can we learn about galaxies? Like, you know, from these observations that we have, what kind of questions can we hope to answer? And so let's see, the first one, perhaps like it's the easiest, is uh, how far away is the galaxy? You know, in other words, like the redshift of distance. Uh, we can also ask how many stars does it have? Um, and uh, how did the assembly of the stars worked in, you know, like during cosmic time, we could ask what is the galaxy's chemical composition? Um, you know, because this is because we know that the Big Bang only made basically hydrogen and helium. And so, you know, like everything else was actually created inside a star. And so, you know, like understanding how this changes in time is quite interesting. Um, what is the role? And, you know, by this, I mean, it's like, you know, how much of this we have, what this is made of, and what's the geometrical distribution of cosmic dust? which is actually uh, the dark stuff that you can see here in the first picture. And how often things like galaxy collisions or mergers happen. And finally, how do things change as the universe progresses? So these are all things that we would like to know. The problem, or one of the problems that we have is that, you know, when you know, I say galaxy, typically, you know, I'm sure that you sort of like, you know, in your mind, you conjure uh, a picture which looks more or less like this. You know, it's pretty, you have a lot of details, you have a lot of colors. However, you know, like as soon as you reach certain distances, galaxies stop looking like this 
and instead they look like tiny little blobs with very little detail, right? So here, these are like some, some galaxies in the Hubble ultra deep field, and you can see that, you know, like most of them just look like tiny dots. So when we think about ways to gain information, just, you know, like looking at pictures and, you know, like hoping to understand something from shapes is just not uh, a possibility. So as an alternative, what we can do is to uh, try to collect information at different wavelengths, right? So that rather than having like just one little blob, we have many little blobs and the brightness of all the little blobs at the different wavelengths give us complementary information, even if a galaxy is really far away. So this is just, you know, for pretty pictures, since I don't have many, uh, this is just like our own Milky Way. Uh, of course, you know, like when we look at the Milky Way, it just looks like a, like a tiny stripe in the sky. But you can see here that uh, in at optical wavelengths, what you see is like, you know, like all of these dark lines, and this is like what dust is doing. It's absorbing light in the optical, but then this light is re-emitted in the infrared. And so if you look at, you know, things like near, mid, or, you know, like far infrared, you can see like, you know, the full shape of the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. It was really nice to see. If we have a really detailed chart of the luminosity of the galaxy uh, as a function of wavelength, then we call this a spectrum. And so this is what you can see right here. You see like a spectrum between, you know, like this is like almost like visible and near infrared wavelengths. And you can distinguish sort of like, you know, two parts. One, is this sort of like, you know, zigzaggy thing that is, you know, like, of course, has like, you know, it rises and then it falls a little bit, but it's like more constant. And this is what we call the continuum. It describes the average, the average brightness of the galaxy at that wavelength. And then there are some like really sharp features that are, and these are like emission or absorption lines. So, you know, this kind of scenario in which we have like a spectrum like this is like, you know, the best thing that can happen. However, a lot of times we don't really have a spectrum, but we have something like a sampling that is much coarser of the brightness of a galaxy. And this is called photometry. And it is like, you know, analog to imaging, to what happens when we uh, take the pictures and then we basically like superpose uh, the three uh, colored filters. So photometry is done by basically like letting the photons that come from a certain object get through filters of different width. The width of these filters are like, you know, hundreds, but it can even be thousands of angstrom. And because of this, it's much easier to obtain than a spectrum because, you know, in a spectrum you have like really fine resolution. So you have to wait to have enough photons at that very specific wavelength before you can claim a certain signal to noise. But in this case, um, uh, in the case of photometry, you are like much more lenient with the photons that you let in in a certain filter. And so this type of data are much easier to obtain. And so these are also a lot more common. And so in summary, what we have, you know, we have this like, you know, emission charts at uh, different wavelengths. And uh, uh, according to the resolution, we could call this like spectrum or we could call it imaging or photometry. But what we really want to know about these galaxies are things like stellar mass, the star formation history, the dust content, the chemical enrichment history, or the redshift or distance. So how can we do that? Well, for a long time, basically the only thing that we could do was something called spectral energy distribution fitting. And so in this case, uh, what happens is that um, you know, we have some data and, you know, like I'm giving you this data here. This is, you know, like photometry clearly for a total of like nine data points. And this is like, you know, real data I had to work with. And then you're like, okay, um, I have this measured plexus, like measured brightnesses. I want to know the physical property of these galaxies. What can I do? Well, with just this, you really can't do anything. There is at least one other thing that you need, and these other things are models. And so if you have models, models tell you, you know, as a function of the parameters you're trying to measure. 
what would the spectra of these galaxies look like? And so let's say that you know, I have this model, as you can see, is not a great model, right? It doesn't really go through the data very well. So, you know, we may try another model. It's model two. Now, you know, this is a little bit better. We can see that we can sort of like, you know, get some of the data points. So, you know, it's more similar to what the data are, but not great. And then we can continue this game. Maybe we add another model that you can see that here, now, you know, like the results that we have are quite a bit better. This is not perfect, but, you know, is a reasonable fit, how we like to call it, to the data that we have. Now, what's the utility of doing so? Well, the main game here is that because you know what are the physical properties of the models, you know what is like the age of the stellar mass of that model galaxy, then you can say, okay, if the model looks like the data, then I can assume that their properties will be the same. So anytime you're fitting something, this is the game that you're playing. You are proposing models whose properties are known, you find something that looks like the data, and then you assume that this correspondence holds also at the level of physical properties. And, you know, like I spent a lot of my time uh, worrying about the following things. One, how do I tell whether a model resembles the data? Two, how do I pick models in a way that is efficient? So rather than, you know, like picking a lot of models, I model one that don't work at all, uh, getting something like model three, which is like much more reasonable. And three, how do I compute the uncertainties on these um, estimates that I'm making? So though I'm not gonna go in detail on this, but I do want to uh, talk for a minute about one algorithm that I wrote by now like a long time ago. Uh, it was, I mean, it is still called Gallium Seal, but I don't maintain it anymore. And it was the first publicly available Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm for spectral energy distribution fitting. And then a year later, I also did like a new version called SpeedMC that was like a lot faster than his friend. Nowadays, as I was mentioning, they've been retired. But um, I want to show you, you know, at least, you know, like what, what a spectral energy distribution fitting algorithm needs to do are two things. One is being able to propose models as functional parameters, and the other is being able to explore the parameter space in a way that is efficient. So uh, this is an example of how the likelihood function uh, is calculated. So the likelihood function is where I say, okay, I'm gonna say that the probability, well, actually I should say the likelihood, I shouldn't call it a probability, uh, but um, the likelihood associated to a certain set of parameters here is given by a function of the difference between the theoretical spectrum associated to certain parameters and the data weighed by their error distribution. So the data points that has a very large error count less and data points that have a very smaller sensitivity uncertainties count more. But building this spectrum is quite difficult, right? How do I model a galaxy? Well, this is, you know, like just an idea of the step. I start from sort of like stellar population synthesis models that literally tell me what is the emission spectrum of stars. And, you know, like when I have a certain stellar population, that means like that a bunch of stars are born at the same time with the mass distribution that I assume to be known. And so this is, you know, like how I start building my galaxy. Then from there, I have to decide what's the star formation history of a galaxy. It could be just like a burst, like a delta function, like all stars born at the same time. It could be something that is constant. It could be like bursty. Uh, it could be linearly increasing or decreasing. It could be exponentially declining or increasing. And you know, you probably think, well, how come you don't know any of these things? But the truth is, it's very difficult to understand how this process works. And so, you know, especially after recently, any of these possibilities was uh, equally probable. From that, you need to add some like nebular emission from young stars and uh, I, misplaced my little videos so now i can't see any more on my screen oh, go away. oh yes correct for dust absorption according to like you know, a certain distribution for which we have some models repeat if you believe there are other different stellar populations 
then you have to place the spectrum at the right redshift, correct from absorption from the intergalactic medium, move to the observed frame, which means like, you know, because of redshift, the spectrum is trashed and, you know, it needs to be dimmed by uh, a certain amount that is proportional to the inverse square luminosity distance. Then you have to mimic what your telescope is doing to your data. So you have to multiply by the filter transmissions and transform this to flux density. And then you get sort of like the theoretical flux that enters the likelihood. And so you can see that this process is not only quite complicated, but you know, each one of these steps is an incredible uh, simplification in reality. You know, we're trying to do to our like novel spectrum, something that nature took billions of years to do to a galaxy. And so even if it sounds like, you know, pretty well thought out in reality, you know, there's like, you know, a lot of chance for error in every single one of these steps. And then I guess, you know, I'm going to leave the discussion of, you know, how you explore the parameter space in a Marco chain Monte Carlo manner. Uh, to some other time, or you know, if you want, you can ask me more about this. But you know, MCMC is basically an efficient way of uh, you know traveling around in parameter space to find the interesting region, and then basically once you find this, spend all the time there, uh, and then it also provides a very easy way of computing uncertainties without having to assume anything on the shape of your probability distribution function. So anyway, you can build algorithms like this. Do they work? Well, the problem here is that for galaxies, we, you know, we never know what the truth is. Other than redshift, for which we have like, you know, spectroscopy, the sort of like, you know, gives us a way of measuring them directly. It's very hard to test any of your methods on data just because, you know, like the truth is not anywhere to be found. So usually the best that we can do is to test on mocks. And in this case, you know, this is what I'm presenting here. Basically what you have is like for four different parameters, redshift, this is dust, uh, age, and stellar mass of the galaxies. Uh, we look at the difference between estimated and true. So, you know, in a perfect world, this is like, you know, just a tiny little line with no thickness and it's horizontal, but even like this is not bad, right? You have very few outliers and not a lot of scatter and you can see that this seems quite unbiased, meaning that like the average result is on point. So yay, victory dance. Now, from 2011, when I published this code to today, which you know I told you like it was like the first public available code to do these things of SED fitting, we have a lot of them that have come out. And the reason for this, as I was mentioning to you yesterday, is that we have a lot of data. And so, you know, like galaxy surveys, just like, you know, have multiplied in terms of, you know, like number of a galaxy that we're looking at, richness of the data. And so the tools likely have sort of like, you know, fold. And now we can choose between very, very many of them. So let me tell you something about their successes. And there are quite a few to be found. Uh, in general, we have improved in many ways. We have improved in flexibility, which is mainly related to modeling. We have learned uh, to model the stellar populations a lot better. We have improved in speed. Like now we are using uh, exploration of parameter space that are quite fast and quite efficient. And we can use some of the dimensionality reduction techniques that I mentioned yesterday to make sure that we do things faster. We have improved in accuracy. For example, we have found that because our distributions are often skewed, they're multimodal, they're not very regular, uh, there are better algorithms compared to like vanilla-like MCMC that can be used to explore that space. And we have improved in ease of use. So, you know, like up to really just 10 years ago, everyone was coding in Fortran or C. In fact, my code was also in Fortran, I have to confess. But nowadays, uh, um, most of this is done in Python, which is like a much easier language to deal with for students, for example. And so this really has improved accessibility quite a bit. Um, perhaps the best um, result, just like at the science level, is the fact that now we have learned how to put the results from the entire electromagnetic spectrum together. 
It used to be that astronomers, like you know, UV astronomers, near infrared astronomers, and far infrared astronomers, or radio, would never talk to one another. But now finally we have learned that the best information, the best inference can be obtained if we are able to look at the entire spectrum. And so this is called panchromatic estimations. Astronomers love to say panchromatic, you know, it's like you know, every other paper on this stuff that you see, it has like this like panchromatic somewhere. But still, it's a good thing. And so we have, you know, like we are better modeling emission lines and dust. Um, we have understood a bit more the evolution of stars, which are like the building blocks of these things. We have understood uh, how the generacies work or, you know, like how you can have like different solutions that really like, you know, stretch your uncertainties in certain directions and now we can deal with them. Uh, we have understood more from cosmological simulations the fact that you know, like the process of star formation often has a stochastic component that comes from like traumatic events, for example, like collisions, mergers. And we have learned that there are some parameters that are better suited to study galaxies. For example, we used to try and measure age, which was like the onset of like, you know, the moment the first star was formed. And now we have understood that this is not a good parameter to have, but we can have a much better um, handle on like, the time that it took for a galaxy to build, say, 50% of its stars. So this has been really nice. Let me look at this question real quick. Are there ab initial models you can use in a hybrid way? Uh, I'm sorry, Yanis, I don't understand the question. Do you want to tell me a bit more about it? Yeah, uh, it's, I, I don't know if in, in astronomy or cosmology is done, but for example, in, in simulations of the early universe, like baby universe, like microseconds, you, mm -hmm. you, 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 you do simulations, for example, quantum field theory, like quantum thermodynamics, and you use a hybrid method like half Monte Carlo and then half molecular dynamics mm. in order to do kind of like a, a, a hybrid method. Like you do a little bit of the, of the random like, you know, Monte Carlo simulation to get you to a certain point of the phase space. And then from there, now you do the, the real like field equations, like a, a, a real time, let's say, uh, a real equation simulation, and that's called that's called the hybrid method. It's hybrid molecular dynamics and hybrid Monte Carlo. I don't know if, if there are any models of Emisio would study like accretion, like particle agglomeration in galaxies that would be considered like as a more physical models of what's happening. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'll uh, touch upon this just a little bit. I think this can happen, it happens for us at the simulation level in the sense that the best way that we have to uh, simulate stellar, like star formation, for example, or just like, you know, structure formation as a whole is through really expensive uh, hydrodynamical simulations. Uh, and then I think what people are just starting to explore now is, you know, trying to have something which is like a bit simpler to get to a point and then have some like zoom ins where you know you sort of like you know plug in a smaller size hydrodynamical simulations to get to the detail that you want. The problem here is that for each single galaxy when you're exploring space at this point you need to have like millions of iterations and so I feel like that we're not quite at the level where we can plug in this better model quite yet. But I think that there is like, you know, it's, it's a very active field of development. I think it will hopefully become uh, accessible for uh, galaxy formation astronomers as well. And so we are trying to sort of, you know, like merge this traditional method with, uh, a, let me say like, you know, a, a more, you know, like with sort of like insert complexity were needed to sort of like uh, clear up some of these nodes that appear, some of these degeneracies that we have with the simple models. Um, let's see. So I wanted to just show you quickly how this process works uh, using this prospector, just because I think it's like really cool. Uh, using prospector, which is, I believe, you know, like in my opinion, is like the best uh, SED fitting code that we have today. Uh, it was like developed uh, by the Harvard group uh, at the Center for Astrophysics and you know like all of this is available so I also added the link. And so let's take a look here. 
Um, what we are going to do is we are going to show what happens to the different parameters we are trying to measure as we add more data and different wavelengths. And so this is like the very beginning. We only have one point and you know, like the blue spectrum is the truth that we know nothing about. Now we are assuming that we've only measured you know, one point, you know, like one photometric observation. And here, these are the parameters of the models. There are stellar parameters such as stellar mass, age, metallicity. There are dust attenuation parameters that I was you know, trying to explain quickly, you know, relate to the amount and distribution of dust. There are dust emission parameters, and this is like AGM parameters. This is sort of like a separate component of an active galactic, nu active galactic nucleus. So here you have a total of 12. And you start with some priors, which sort of you know, gives you uh, your prior beliefs before data comes on how those could potentially be distributed, what are the most likely values, because this is like a Bayesian framework. And the true value is the blue. So you can see that basically like one data point, there's not much you can do. And so we can start uh, you know, doing a fitting, but really you, know, you only have one anchor. And so in this case, your best fit model would be the black and the posterior, which is like, you know, your sort of like overall uncertainty uh, will be like the uh, um, shaded gray area. And you can see that uh, the posterior distributions that you find on parameters are basically completely dominated by the priors, which are the red curves. Now, if I add at least one other data point, which is like the G band, uh, still you have like still similar behavior, but you can see that uh, the true and estimated model start to get a bit closer to one another, although you still have very large uncertainties. And now this is like a five band model, which is like, uh, we have a lot of data for a lot of galaxies with these five bands. And this is like quite similar to what LSSD will do for uh, 20 billion galaxies. Actually, LSSD will have like one additional band. So this gives you an idea of the results that we can have. And now, you know, you still like the posterior, which is uh, the gray area, is still mostly dominated by the prior, but this is not the case, at least for all parameters. And then, you know, as you keep adding the near infrared, now the near infrared really gives you a strong handle on stellar mass. And if you look at the stellar mass here, you can see that you have a really narrow distribution when the prior is basically uh, unimportant and, you know, it's quite close to the true value. And, you know, for the dust, you still have pretty wide posteriors, especially for dust emission. But if you keep going and now you're adding the near uh, and far ultraviolet, and uh, here you're starting to add points in the mid infrared and the far infrared. Now basically you have like a really good estimation of uh, what your spectrum, what your best model would be, and a really nice estimation of basically all the parameters in which other than the age that as I mentioned is a really tricky thing to measure, um, you are not dominated by the prior at all. And so, you know, uh, I think we can also see it in real time, but I felt like that, you know, having it just a real time without explanation wasn't sufficient. And so, you know, I think like it's nice to go at least one time through all the steps. So overall, as I mentioned, uh, SED fitting has been like incredibly successful, but you know, there's always another side to any story. And so, you know, I want to tell you before we break about its failures. And so one of the problems that we have observed is that there is still so much systematic uncertainties in the models that we use that often, and this is like, you know, a plot uh, from a paper that I published again, like almost 10 years ago, but I feel like, you know, it's still <laughs> relevant. So just by changing things like the stellar library or the metallicity, which is often something that we cannot measure with high precisions with data that we have, you can have easily up to a factor of three differences in stellar mass. And now this may be something that we cannot um, fix, uh, but it's quite relevant because this means that even if we take better data, even if we spend a lot of time on expensive telescopes looking at these galaxies, 
we are not dominated by statistical error, we are dominated by systematics. And so this tells us, okay, this is you know, something that we need to work on and is specific in particular to this type of techniques. Another problem that we have with SED fitting is that perhaps because we don't know the right priors, and so maybe like we are putting in things that are not great, or because we need to simplify our models enough that we have a number of parameters that is not ballooning so that we can handle it computationally, um, we observe that often there is a bias in the properties that uh, we derive. And this is actually something that is common to all MCMC methods. And in general, we always tend to overestimate the contribution of young stellar populations. This is because young stellar populations shine really bright in the UV and optical, and old stellar populations, they just have like very low luminosity and they hide in the infrared, and you can add a ton of old stars that you know, like blow red blow, um, reddish, and so you know, are mostly visible in the red and the near infrared without basically changing the spectrum very much. And this is something that's really hard to overcome, and so it's, in some sense, it's a limitation of the entire technique. And finally, and you know, like this is definitely one of the most relevant for our discussion, is the fact that, you know, for each galaxy, I'm looking at something like 10 to 12 parameters. And this is not even one of the most complicated models that I can have, right? Like, for example, there are no parameters related to star formation history here, which should definitely be part of the game. If I use something like Prospector for 15,000 galaxies, which is, you know, like just the one of like the Goods North field that we saw yesterday, it takes about 0.5 million CPU hours, which is 57 years. Now, of course, you know, you can use more than one core, you have super clusters, you know, like this is actually something that we can, you know, bring back down to a few weeks instead. But if you had to do it for 30 billion galaxies, now this would take 100 million years. And so this is perhaps the most convincing argument for saying, okay, is there something we can do to go beyond spectral energy distribution fitting to understand the properties of galaxies. And so I think here, uh, I'm, you know, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer a couple. Otherwise I propose that we break for about 10 minutes and then I will tell you about sort of, you know, how machine learning can help us in this quest for another half an hour or so. Uh, restart and so you know like after talking about how we can learn stuff about galaxies with traditional methods uh, I want to present like at least one um, SED fitting sorry one approach that is uh, beyond traditional SED fitting and uses uh, machine learning so let's see this is a project that we started in 2000 18, or actually probably late 2017, uh, with uh, Chris Perlovel, who was a graduate student at the time. Uh, he was in the UK and he came to visit me uh, for six months. And then, you know, like uh, we started working on this project and it took us longer than we expected, but we were like quite happy with the result. And so what we thought is that we wanted to try and measure uh, the star formation histories of the galaxies uh, using machine learning. And now, of course, as I mentioned, uh, using machine learning means that in general you need to have some sort of learning set that you need to use. And for us, our like learning set was like a suite of uh, hydrodynamical simulations. And this is, you know, what you're seeing here in uh, uh, the bottom left part of this slide. Uh, this is uh, a simulation for a particular galaxy. You can see redshift uh, at the top left corner of the plot. And so you can see that actually the life of a galaxy is quite eventful. Uh, there are a lot of collision that may take place. There is, uh, um, uh, you know, like a lot of these are called like minor mergers when actually it's a small satellite that is phagocytated by a bigger galaxy. Uh, you can see that uh, 
uh, you have cosmic dust that you know is creating these sort of like darker areas in the disk of a galaxy. You can see stellar streams, which are these like long tails that follow the angular momentum and rotation of a galaxy. You can see that sometimes material is expelled out of the galaxy as the result of this like rich dynamics. And then, you know, like now that redshift is finally getting close to zero, you can see that, you know, like a large spiral galaxy has born. So it's really cool, right? But imagine trying to capture even just like the essential events of the story, what all you can see is one snapshot at one time, which is the spectrum. And so hopefully, you know, like this gives you an idea of how complicated the problem is. And to go back to uh, the question about the ab initio models, so you know, if we could sort of like you know, transfer some of the extended knowledge that is available uh, in things like the simulations that really take into account all this accretion progress, process in the way we inform uh, our fitting models, that would be incredibly helpful. So what we thought with Chris is like, okay, uh, let's now consider star formation history of galaxies of two of the, you know, like most state of the heart simulations that we have in astronomy today, which are called illustrious and eagle. So uh, the great advantage with respect to the modeling is that we're not choosing a functional form. We're starting for training from the real star formation histories. And then from them, we can generate a couple of galaxies with realistic spectra that will be our learning set. And then we thought, okay, we can try and teach a convolutional neural network, or really like any algorithm, but in the end, this is what we decided to go with. We tried to teach the connections between the spectra that we observed and the star formation histories that we want to infer. And then we conducted a bunch of testing, both within the same simulation and across different simulations to see how well our method can generalize. So why do we expect machine learning to be successful in this case? Well, one of the main reasons um, is, as I mentioned, the fact that we don't need to specify a model for how the star formation is proceeding. You know, like we still have a sort of parameterization because we did parameterize as, you know, a constant piecewise functions in different time intervals, but nothing beyond that. And then we can hope to avoid this like outshining bias, this sort of like preference for younger stellar population that is like uh, intrinsically uh, embedded in the MCMC method. And finally, something quite important in my opinion is the fact that when you learn from a training set, from a learning set, what you do is you collect information both at the object level and at the population level. You not just learn what are the properties of a single object, but you can also um, sort of like add to your information content things like what is common and what is uncommon. And so sort of like it's sort of equivalent, you know, this is definitely not mathematically rigorous, but it's um, analog in a way, in my opinion, uh, to learning both uh, the priors and the properties of the single object at the same time in Bayesian statistics. Um, well, that's a, a, like I'll answer this question from the chat because it's relevant. relevant. What is the basis that machine learning can avoid the outshining bias? I don't think there is a basis that it can avoid it, but basically there's no reason why it should have it. Like in Bayesian statistics, this comes from the fact that younger stellar population affect the SED more. And because what you're doing is, you know, like you're building an estimator that is, um, that has, uh, contains explicitly the signal to noise when you build your likelihood function, this is retained. And here in machine learning, there's no reason why this should happen. It's true, it's not a demonstration that it will not happen, but a priori, you know, it's like, there's no reason to think that it will be retained. Um, on the other hand, which is, you know, sort of like what is less uh, than ideal about machine learning is that, well, first in general, because we're learning about a specific population, understanding how our method can generalize is a bit more difficult. And then, I mean, of course, the fact that typically 
for this data, we don't have a ground truth. And so all of our training uh, relies on simulations. And so, you know, if the simulations are perfect, well, great. We know that they aren't. And so in general, there is this like, you know, big, uh, I don't want to call it a leap of faith, but I'm going to call it like a source of systematic error that can come from the fact that the simulations are not perfect. And for some very limited cases, like maybe very nearby galaxies where one can conjure like some other more direct methods of, using, of measuring things like, you know, stellar masses, there is the possibility of training on data directly of sort of like, you know, getting some truth for data, but this is not the case for most of these methods. But anyway, I feel like, you know, Chris and I thought, okay, this is the first time we feel like the simulation are quite at the right level in the sense that people had shown that, you know, like they can reproduce a whole set of properties of observational properties of galaxies in the universe. And so we thought that it was worth a shot, you know, with these caveats. So these are like sort of like you know, six examples going from you know things that work really well to things that didn't work so well. And so in these plots, what you see like on the x-axis, you have look back time. So you know, like towards the left, you have like the more recent process of star formation. And as you go towards the right, you're moving towards uh, you know, like the uh, like the very beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. Uh, and then on the y-axis, you have the star formation rate. And you can see that what we did here is like we divided in, I believe it's like eight bins. And we're just saying, okay, this is, you know, we're looking at the star formation history as, uh, you know, a piecewise function that is constant in each of these bins, but we're not putting any constraint on what shape it can have. It can have. And, you know, like the blue is the true and the red is the predicted. And so here you see a case in which we do really well, and as we move to the right, we're still doing quite well here, quite well here. And then like the last one is an object in which we're not doing great. We're you know, missing about 30% of the overall of stars formed in, and, you know, between let's say half and one uh, giga year in the past, which is you know, like not great. Now, this is, you know, just like a general idea, but something that I wanted to comment on because it's something that we spent a lot of time on that we hadn't anticipated. And so I think this fits into John's question of how long does it take to solve the problem is the fact that I feel like often, as you know, it happens in all uh, fields of science and, you know, like in all problems, uh, usually uh, the trickiest aspects are not the ones that you had anticipated. And so for us, for example, we found that one thing that we spent a lot of time debating was how should we evaluate the models? What makes a successful model? And this is, I feel like, something that characterizes a lot the differences between studying machine learning in sort of like a computer science setting, which, you know, you have this like, you're really a lot more interested in the methods than you're interested in the data. And so the data are often quite trivial and um, I feel like, you know, like the metrics that you have things like, you know, accuracy or, you know, this particular type of entropy or like the mean square error are completely sufficient to identify what you want to minimize. But I feel like in most science applications, this is like a very non-trivial question. For example, for us in the beginning, we thought that, you know, what we use to say, okay, you know, we're doing, you know, how close are these two curves to one another? We say, let's use like median absolute error. Absolute error, just, you know, the absolute difference between true and prediction. And then we're taking the median across this like whatever 10 bins or eight bins, I believe that we have. Now, so these all seem to make sense. But then we thought, hey, you know what? There are some galaxies that uh, have pretty strong star formation activity. So you can see here that in this like left examples, all galaxies are forming stars at the rate of about 15, perhaps like 25 at their maximum stellar masses per year, right? Forming between 15 and 25 stars like the sun every year. She's quite active. The Milky Way is only making like one or two. Uh, but there are also more Milky Way-like 
galaxies. And so this galaxy in particular has a star formation history that is almost constant through time. But, you know, it's only forming stars at the rate of like about three stellar masses per year. But, you know, just because there is, you know, like these two are almost one order of magnitudes away, using something that says a difference of 10 here is 10 times worse than, uh, you know, a difference of one here doesn't quite work. And so we thought perhaps we need something which is a bit more percentage. So we said, okay, you know what, maybe uh, we should use instead this like median absolute percentage error. This tells us, you know, how far we are in overall shape of the curve, not just the absolute difference, right? This makes sense. However, then, you know, we started thinking about examples like this one. This is basically a quiescent galaxy. Quiescent means that the galaxy is not forming stars at all. It was in remote times, right? So we're taking about, you know, a few billion years ago. But since then, perhaps it has run out of gas, which is like the fuel from which new stars can be made. Maybe it lives in isolation, so there's nothing exciting like, you know, a merger or some sort of interaction that can bring fresh new gas to the galaxy. And so for the past like one billion years or so, it hasn't formed any star. And you can see that, you know, I would say that this reconstruction is quite good. However, the problem is that when you build something which is like a percentage, you have like the true value on the bottom. And so if you're dividing by zero, I don't need to tell you that, you know, your error estimator would blow up even if you're actually quite close. So we said, okay, um, for the third iteration, iteration, we chose something called SMAPE, which is stands for symmetric mean average percentage error. It's basically another um, rewriting of the percentage error where the sum over all the beans, rather than happening like, you know, I, like I calculate the percent difference bin by bin, and then I add them all up or average, uh, I'm gonna put on the bottom, the sum of the surface estimated star formation rate for the entire path, which means that, you know, I'm always normalizing by something that is non-zero. This works quite nicely. So we were like quite happy with this. Now we started thinking about you know, galaxies like the one that you see now, which, you know, are quiescent, but we have solved this problem, no, no issues. But here, for these galaxies, we were actually estimated like, you know, a terrible SMAPE. It's actually you know, a SMAPE of like 52%, which is pretty bad, since it sort of like resemble a percentage error. But we thought that in this case, we're not doing so poorly because yes, we are swapping star formation between these two bins, and so, you know, that might not look great on paper, but we also know that these are the two beans that are, you know, like, you know, five and 10 billion years ago. And the difference between the spectra of galaxies that form stars five and 10 billion years ago is incredibly tiny. So it's fair that we cannot, uh, you know, distinguish between like the next to last and the last bin in terms of star formation. And so we shouldn't penalize things like this when we are training which means perhaps we needed yet another evaluation metric. And so we experimented with like, you know, the dot product of this map in all the bins times the output response, which means sort of like, you know, a weight that tells you, you know, like how badly or how strongly the spectrum, which is your observable, can be affected by that. Now, in the end, we didn't go for this, but, you know, I guess like my bottom line from this, which is that, you know, we thought that the difficult part would be, you know, like to set up the deep learning algorithm. But in the end, you know, or in general, when you study things like, you know, when you take a deep learning course, you know, learn about, oh, okay, I'm gonna have this like super fancy algorithm. Oh, what should be my dropout rate? Okay, how many layers am I gonna put? Um, how am I gonna clean your data? This is also okay, important. But, you know, we didn't anticipate having to spend so much time thinking about, you know, what's the best evaluation process, but we found that it was really, really important because we're doing science, right? And so in the end, uh, understanding uh, what metric gives you the best science outcome is not only very important, but also something that you can only do if you really know your data and your physics quite well. Uh, 
Then another thing that we did was to say, okay, you know, we know that uh, if we use for training similar objects, you know, like our objects from the same simulations, we're doing quite well. We had sort of like a within simulation error about 11, 12%, which is not bad. This is like per bin. Uh, but we also noticed that if we started training our algorithm on one simulation and applying to the other one, which is, you know, like the first resemblance of what could happen when you move on to data. And now we found that, you know, I can't quantify this, but let's say that we found that the error didn't blow up. Now it moved maybe like, you know, from 12 to like, you know, 16%. So this also was something that warranted uh, uh, victory dance made us very happy. Uh, then we started saying, okay, what could be a way to ensure that not only I can believe my algorithm on simulated data or on simulated data that are not so far from, or, you know, or other simulated data, but on the real stuff. And we thought, well, if I could tell you that the data and the simulations look exactly the same, if I can show you that, you know, like for a certain slice of redshift or stellar mass or whatnot, the spectra from the simulations uh, look exactly the same as, you know, the real spectrum, then probably this argument will be quite convincing. Right? So we started thinking, how can we visualize perhaps the distribution of simulations and data and show that they are somewhat similar? And so what we did for this paper was really like a very preliminary step for this, which is we created a nonlinear two-dimensional projection of our spectra, uh, which is called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. It's, it's a popular strategy for, you know, like boiling down data to two dimensions and, you know, with the property that if two points are close in shape, you know, like, as spectra, so in a large dimensional space, they're also assumed to be um, projected down to neighboring spaces in this new 2D things. And so what we obtain, you know, like on the left, you see the data, they occupy this very funny shaped space. And then sort of like the, the footprint of like the total of the tree is like the gray area that you see as background. And then Illustrious was the first simulations. And so every galaxy here is one point and Eagle was the other simulation. So every galaxy here is another point. So what is this showing you? As you can see, I mean, this is not normalized for density. And you can see that in both cases, you know, like um, in both simulated cases, which are like plots two and three, some objects are missing, right? The objects that are on the very edge uh, are missing. And so this tells you, okay, you know, data and simulation, they are not really, you know, very close to each other. However, the fact that the overall shape is quite similar, the fact that, you know, like simulation and data uh, lie in a fairly similar space uh, is, you know, provide some hope that this method could potentially work. And actually I spent a good part of my sabbatical thinking about how to make this argument more formal, how to establish some sort of like distance that could act as a similarity measure. And as I was telling you so far, I'm failing. I think it's fair to say, uh, but I learned a lot of things in the process and I'm really hopeful that, you know, at the end uh, I can get to, you know, something meaningful because I think that, you know, for astronomy, uh, the ability of training on simulations uh, can be, I think will be increasingly important. And let's see, I think I should be getting close to finishing. Uh, I guess that, you know, like maybe I'll just spend a few minutes uh, talking to you about um, what I feel like the next step would be, like the next, you know, five or 10 years in like astronomy and data science. So I think like, you know, the past decade has been a decade in which, you know, astronomers have sort of like, you know, woken up to this big data uh, revolution. And we have learned about, you know, like all of these new techniques that are out there and that can be helpful for us. Uh, and I think like the two uh, main uh, 
set of problems, let's say, that we'll have to deal with will be validation and adaptation and interpretability. You know, this is of course like a very personal view. So in terms of validation, I think, you know, one of the things that I was telling you about, which is how can we devise tests of our techniques where ground truth is not available, right? We are okay in using simulated data as learning sets, um, but we know that they are not perfect. And so, you know, like what happens when the training domain and the application domain are different? And, you know, how can we compensate for this difference? And how can we assess what the expected performance of our methods will be, noting that, you know, most likely this will also be dependent on the algorithm that uh, we choose in the sense that, you know, the generalization properties of a convolutional neural network may not be the same of, you know, like a simple algorithm. Uh, the other, perhaps, you know, like the adaptation side, which I feel like we have made a few more steps uh, towards, is the idea of transfer learning. So, you know, large training sets, even with all the data that we have, are very hard to come by. And then, you know, like deep neural networks, deep neural models are very expensive to train. And so sort of like being able to recycle knowledge from one survey to another, for example, will be extremely important. So perhaps like the nicest, you know, I would say the pioneering, but also nicest example comes from this paper, which is from 2018, in which the problem was once again classifying galaxies based on their morphologies. And there were like a lot of, uh, you know, pre-trained models on uh, SDSS galaxies, uh, but the application domain was galaxies from the dark energy survey. So different depth of the observation, different like seeing property, different point spread function, which is just, you know, like what happens in the atmosphere and so on. However, there was a lot of knowledge that could be recycled from the SDSS galaxies in terms of, you know, like what are the features that we need to have that, you know, that are most uh, meaningful when we're trying to decide what shape is our galaxies and so on. And so uh, the authors of this study were able to show that if they included this like domain adaptation step, not only they had a significant improvement in the accuracy of the result, but, and I feel like this is like a real, real game changer, to get to the same performance, they needed a training set that was one order of magnitude smaller. And so I felt that this was like a really, really important result and something that I expect to see a lot more of in the future. Uh, the other challenge, as I said, will be, I think, interpretability and explainability. And actually there was like a grad student that has, you know, like a, a completely free available uh, interpretable machine learning book, which I think is very good and I recommend. But, you know, like a lot of the techniques that have been proposed to explain the results of, you know, deep learning algorithm that tends to be very opaque are bordered from computer science. So for example, there is this line uh, in which uh, rather than modeling, uh, you know, like a relationship between like input and output in a certain algorithm, uh, the algorithm try to understand, trying to model the response of a very complicated algorithm, like a neural network, with a simpler algorithm, like could be like, you know, a decision tree that is very interpretable. And so, you know, this is uh, meant to cast some light on why the network is making certain decisions. Another one is called SHAP, Shapley Additive Explanation. And the idea here is that you use the different features, which are the different input of a neural network algorithm as players and use game theory to understand how they talk and interact with one another. And then finally, something called recourse analysis um, aims at understanding what changes in feature which cause a decision to be reversed. And so again, this is like a way of understanding how the different input participate in making a decision. So these are all, I feel like, great starting point. Uh, one of the issues with this is that in science, I feel like we have a much higher standard for explainability, right? In some sense, I feel like, you know, if you're investing money and your investments are going well, you're not gonna ask that many questions about, you know, how exactly the algorithm is speaking, you know, like one stock versus the other. But I think like for us, uh, if, you know, we're really interested in understanding 
why things are happening. You know, like if I'm getting this deformation history from a certain spectrum, I want to understand, you know, how this mapping is working, why? Because I can learn a lot of new physics from understanding why this is happening. So I guess is, you know, almost time to stop. Uh, and you know, I'll be, able, I'll be happy to answer some more questions, but I want to leave with maybe some thoughts about you know how mm, the figure and role of the physicist, and you know, I guess because my field is astronomy, I would say like an astrophysicist. Uh, you know, what does it mean to be an astrophysicist today? And you know, I don't really have an answer for this, but you know. Typically, I feel like, you know, when we think of a physicist or an astrophysicist, for most of us, at least, you know, like Einstein would be like the first model that comes to mind. And uh, I feel like, you know, hopefully, we're starting to see that this is uh, at least a somewhat dated picture in the sense that, you know, like, I feel like this is not someone that needs to be a man, not someone who needs to be old, not someone who needs to be riding on a blackboard. So hopefully, there will be like, you know, many possible iterations, but at least like not just these. And so as final thoughts, I, I thought perhaps to reflect on, you know, what this change has brought about and what I think is my personal wish list for like scientists and the people who work around us. So in general, I feel like because we have this richer data, data analysis in astronomy has changed radically and I feel like this is good and you know, it also creates new responsibilities. So I feel like that as scientists, um, we need to have a strong understanding of computational tools and we need to commit to the scientific method very seriously once we are losing transparency. And we need to hold to a really high standard for the reproducibility of our result and be very uh, open in sharing things like, you know, like results and data and code. And I think as mentors, uh, I, I think we need to encourage cross-disciplinary collaborations. And so, you know, hopefully this was a little iteration, a little, you know, realization of this. And also be aware of the job market and how it's changing for our students and how important it is to stay connected to that. And as reviewers or funding agencies, I guess, you know, I've only ever been a reviewer, have never been in the position of handling out money, but I think, you know, we could uh, uh, take some benefit from being open to higher risk and higher reward uh, projects. And I don't think it will be easy, but I think it will be worth it. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you. And yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. If you still have the patience to spend some time. So let me uh, remind everyone also that not only are our questions about uh, the lectures welcome, but uh, Fiona offered uh, to answer questions about about the broader problems of uh, leading a life in science and career trajectories and so on. So um, maybe we should do this in order. But if if uh, things occur to you, ah, okay. So it begins. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stop. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, so so far I'm reading two. Um, I think I'm gonna answer Bryce first and John later, just because I feel like the first will be like a quicker answer than the second. Why do I think it's important to be open to higher risk, higher reward? Because I feel like that um, a lot of the most exciting results that we have had have come from looking at things from different angles or being open to finally borrow tools that are very well known in other disciplines and you know, perhaps we don't know yet about. And so I feel like it's very hard to do this, you know, like you need to be given space for an exploratory phase. And unfortunately, the way that you know, research funding works in, uh, you know, certainly in the US, but I think like in most places is that you need to have money to support students and postdocs. 
And so I feel like, you know, putting your mentees in the position of achieving great things also come with, you know, like a bit of risk taking from funding agencies, right? If we propose always the thing that is safe, always the thing that we know will bring another paper, I feel like we're gonna miss out on the most exciting things that we can discover. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, my read on that. Now, let's see, I'm gonna go up back to John because I'm afraid if I don't go in order, then I will uh, miss something. So any general tips on making it in academia? Hi, it's, this is, you know, as you can imagine, a very charged question. Um, my, so I, I guess I will say two things. One is there is really not a single way to be a good scientist. I feel like that, you know, in many ways, I feel like, you know, like many of us are trained to fit a certain mold and, uh, um, you know, and also it may, I don't know if you've ever felt the pressure of feeling that, you know, science should be like the only thing that you're interested in and, you know, you're married to it and should be willing to make any sacrifice. And I think this is really unfair. And so for me, for example, um, the uh, things that got me my best jobs uh, were sort of like random and certain difficult episodes that were not related to uh, my research abilities. Like my second postdocs, I was in a strange position because I was at Princeton as a postdoc and I was supposed to have like an extra year of funding. And then my boss at the time, I don't know if something happened, but he told me like in February, look, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, this funding is not going to be available. And so I had to scramble to find another position. And I had just completed it by chance, uh, given a talk at Rutgers University the week before. And the reason why this had happened is that I had met someone at a conference and I had made uh, like a terrible joke about cookies and being published in the gastronomical journal and then you know we started talking inviting me to give a talk and this was a person that i then emailed and asked you know and said you know hey i'm in the position of having to find a new job do you have any money and it just so happened that it worked out and actually career-wise this was amazing for me it was just like you know great he you know since then he's been like a great mentor and i feel like my career has greatly benefited from this and same thing when i found this job in cuny you know, I feel like the reason why perhaps my resume stood out was because, you know, they were looking for people with experience teaching in like an urban environment. And for me, you know, when I was at Princeton and then at Rutgers, I had been teaching in prisons as a volunteer for several years. And, you know, is this, you know, the reason why I got the job? Not necessarily. I feel like, in, you know, you need other things. But I felt like, you know, many people had told me at the time, oh, you're wasting your time, you know, in these other things, or, you know, like this means that you'll be publishing less. And I really feel that in the end, you know, you have to find what works for you. So I feel like, you know, my first, this was like very long and widely, but my first recommendation is not to doubt yourself. And, uh, you know, to know that if you are happy, I think you're also going to be a better scientist. And my second recommendation is to choose your mentors carefully. And if you feel that you're not supported, choose a different mentors. Because really, I feel like this is the type of career where the people who are supporting you and advising you and, you know, fighting for you and having your back are incredibly important. And so I think if you don't feel supported, you know, like, I would say, don't think that you are the problem. And, you know, like perhaps if you have the chance, look for a better match in your mentor, which I think will make a big difference. So I guess I, I lost my cursor. Okay, let me go down. I hope this was a little bit useful, at least John. Rishi, you have a question. Is there a course on data science and astronomy and how is the career in that? Um, let me think. Well, I teach data science in astronomy. <laughs> I think they are becoming, I think uh, uh, in astronomy specifically, 
Um, at the moment, I don't know. Um, I think many more, I th you know, I think like it's easier to get to this point, sort of like career wise, you know, going for like a master's or a PhD in astronomy and trying to take a curriculum that is um, data science intensive there, just from my understanding of how these things are built in the sense that I think it's an easier transition. Uh, but if you go to um, the job, are you guys, I guess, how, how am I going to do this? Let me see, you know, I want to, there is a, um, like a website where lots of astronomy jobs tend to be posted, which is the AAS, the American Astronomical Society's job register. And I feel like, you know, in the last few, year, few years, uh, there are a lot more jobs that are somewhat, uh, uh, you know, in a mid territory between data science and astronomy, which could be, for example, like, you know, a support scientist for like, you know, big intensive uh, surveys or things like that. So let me see if I can, oh no, what did I do? Let me see if I can share. Well, first of all, I need to, find the chat again. Where did it go? Chat? Okay, back. Then let me see if I can share a browser. Okay. And finally, let me see if I can go to job register. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, there is a pandemic and so actually this <laughs> this list is a lot less populated than the usual but you know if you're interested in for example even exploring what kind of career could be there uh, I would say this is a good place to start and so you know there's a list of like traditional um, postdoctoral predoctoral um, jobs and then there is like quite a bit of like science engineering which is you know like a bit more perhaps like you know a software scientist compared to a data scientist. And there's a bit of science management and then scientific and technical stuff. And so you can see like, you know, quite a few of these like new professional figures are coming up. So senior staff, astronomical data scientists, these are doing like a space telescope, which is the institute that runs the Hubble Space Telescope and like a few more like these. And my experience, because, you know, I've advised students both in like computer science and astro is that it's a bit easier to get there with an astronomy to get a foot in the door with like an astronomy or an astrophysics PhD and, you know, some like, you know, strong uh, data science computation component than the other way around. Can I comment on GAN in astronomy? Does it offer any advantages? Well, yes, I think yesterday I mentioned like GAN as a way of obtaining amazing simulations and actually on as a way of implementing noise reduction. So these are the only like two, um, and in general, uh, they're also being used for things like, you know, classification problems, for example, distinguishing stars and galaxies. I feel like for us astronomers, they're still uh, a little bit in the young, um, category we only had you know we've only started to see papers using uh, GANs in the last couple of years but I think it will have a very strong impact and actually now that I think about it uh, now we are starting to use them also uh, for cosmological simulation things like you know mapping the distribution of uh, H1 in the universe and so on uh, based on maybe some uh, existing uh, hydrodynamical simulations and you know as a way of filling the gaps for like a redshift for which uh, simulations are not available. Um, then let's see, okay. And yeah, you're welcome for the people who are saying thank you. Let's see, um, last one, uh, at least so far, is why do you think one should want to be, oh yes, an astrophysicist? Or related but more broad, why does the world need more physicists who study the cosmos? Um, I don't know really. <laughs> I think this is really, I feel like this, the entire career of a scientist, I feel like this is something that you can only do if you enjoy it on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of my first lecture yesterday that 
for me, astronomy wasn't like a childhood passion. I never went out with a telescope. I thought for a while that I would study math. Then, you know, then I thought I would study theoretical physics. I think in the end, what happens is that when I was admitted for my PhD, I was admitted to both astro and particle physics. And then I met this like awesome person that was doing cosmic microwave background stuff. And I said, I want to work with you. Can you be my advisor? And then, you know, I never looked back. Well, actually I looked back a million times, but you know, just because this is, I'm tendentially like, I'm afraid of commitment. So I feel like, you know, I really enjoy it, but it's really difficult to handle uh, the fact that you don't have job security until very late in your career co compared to many other fields. And um, I think, uh, you know, often like the personal life sacrifices that you're called to make, for example, by relocating to different places uh, may not be acceptable for many. And I think that's also, you know, completely fine. I feel like, you know, you have to know where your limit is. But I think, you know, like the bottom line is, I think um, astrophysics is awesome. And I think academia is a great workplace, you know, not without this problem, but in general, you're surrounded by people who are doing what they love, which I think is, you know, a great thing to have around you. So, and I feel like what I really like about astro is that it's a very, very wide discipline. So again, you know, like I worked on all sorts of things from like early universe physics and inflation to like cosmic microwave background. I work with that. I work on simulations. I work on galaxies. And, you know, if tomorrow, I mean, of course, like I have tenure, so I'm privileged, but I feel like, you know, if tomorrow I decided, okay, you know, I want to study, like, I don't know, the search for extraterrestrial life, this will be available to me. And of course, it will be like a steep learning curve, but I just feel like the discipline is so broad that you're always guaranteed to find interesting things to, to work on and to think about. Um, okay, I have two more questions. You are a white person and immigrant as well. Yes, not to mention a woman. Do you think you enjoyed white privilege in getting to where you are? Or do you think meritocracy is a standard that academia should maintain? Um, I, I don't believe these are exclusive, exclusive for each other, right? It's not that I either enjoyed this or I think. So let me go from part one. I think, um, I don't know if I enjoyed white privilege. It's hard for me to tell, but I definitely enjoyed privilege. And this comes from like the very beginning, from having born I have been born and raised in a country where, you know, like public education is available to everyone. But also the fact that, you know, like, you know, I feel like this is huge. Uh, and uh, the fact that, for example, my family always supported my choice and never thought that, you know, I was instead, you know, it would have been better if, you know, I found a job that was safer or made more money or guaranteed that I would get married sooner or that I would get married at all or, you know. I felt like I had a lot of privilege in having a lot of freedom. So, and, you know, also I felt like, you know, my family financially, we, you know, they were not rich, but they were like comfortable enough that there was no need for me, for example, to, you know, think about finding a job to help, you know, straight out of college as opposed to, you know, like doing what I wanted to do. So I definitely had privilege. Uh, I feel like, you know, there's definitely uh, an issue of white privilege. I feel like I also probably experienced uh, the opposite of that as a woman. Like, and, you know, like I definitely had, uh, you know, several instances of people who, you know, thought that I was not cut out for this or would question my authority or, you know, were just like plainly trying to tell me to go and do something else. So, but I feel like overall, I feel like I've been more privileged than not, for sure. And do I think meritocracy is a standard that academia should maintain? I think this is like a very tricky question. I mean, yes, the answer is yes. I feel like that in general, uh, we should uh, fight for a more fair system. Now, what does it mean though? Because if two people never had the same possibilities, 
never had the same opportunities. Is it fair to judge them on the basis of their accomplishments? Right, which is what meritocracy seemed to uh, mean. And so I think, you know, it's a very complex conversation. Uh, I think just because I think it's a problem that could really be fixed just with meritocracy if we're willing to go all the way back to when children with different means in kindergarten are placed in different schools, if we really want to build something that is fair and then, you know, like, you know, two people can be somewhat evaluated on the basis of the accomplishment that they have. In general, I mean, I, I, I don't know, obviously I don't have a solution for this, but I think uh, one thing that I think is quite important is that we cannot think that as scientists we have no responsibility on this and this is not our job. I feel like that, you know, engaging in this type of discourse and understanding what we can do to do better, to lower the bias that of course is rampant in academia is, I think, an integral part of our jobs. I suppose that, you know, like someone for someone else to worry about. So I'm sorry, I know that this is not, you know, a complete or satisfactory answer, but I feel like it's also a very complex conversation. So I think this is the best I can give so far. All right, we have, I think I'm gonna try and get to like this, like, you know, three last things um, so that we don't go too over with time. What are the prospects for translating results in your to the industry? What approach do you play in create service and pro This is like a very good question. And actually I had, because you know, like I'm always on the verge of quitting it. So at some point I thought I want to go to industry. And so I spent a few years, like now I kind of stop. Well, let's say 2017, 2018, I went to a lot of corporate conferences. I like I gave tutorials to incredibly surprised people about, you know, like galaxies and star formations and data science. And, you know, I went to things like, you know, like Strata, which is like one of the best, biggest data science conference that we had. And, you know, like my only way of attending was to give a talk because I can't pay $3,000 for registration. And then, you know, like I convinced them to give free tickets to all my students to help me with the tutorials. And so we got like a glimpse of this world. And I did quite a few of these. So I think the main difference that I see between academia and industry is that in academia, we really always strive for best, right? We hardly ever work with something that is good enough. And I think that, you know, like in industry, uh, sometimes you have to understand that uh, the best product that you get built is not necessarily the one that performs best, but the one that, you know, like within the time constraint that you have, uh, is something that has certain characteristics. But I do think, I mean, at least, for example, like the students that I advised that took my machine learning course from CUNY, I feel like, you know, one of them, you know, they were in like Microsoft uh, research uh, data science internship, and then they got like a full-time job offer at JP Morgan. Another them went to like to the like, you know, Amazon uh, software scientist program. Another them, we, you know, was hired full-time as uh, a data science slash software science person at MailChimp. So, and you know, what they seem to have reported back is that I feel like if you get the strong foundation that science will give you, I think like adapting to the different demands of industry is not something that is, uh, I mean, it's challenging, but it's definitely doable. And so I feel like that actually, you know, getting training on this is always something that opens door if you want to go to industry at some point. Do I have any advice for someone looking for a position postdoc right now, given the difficult circumstances? Uh, yes, um, well, I mean, not many, and I feel like, you know, it's a really tough job market to navigate. So my first advice is be kind to yourself. And, uh, you know, like, don't pick yourself up if you can't find the position. The other though is there could be quite a few people who, you know, like may have a little, um, you know, like maybe not the full postdoctoral position, but things like, you know, funding for six months and so on. So um, I, like, I don't know, Vanessa, what your field exactly is. I know, for example, that there are several like networking uh, groups, like, you know, on Facebook, there is, uh, like, there are several groups for like women astronomers. And I know that, you know, like people are, are being encouraged there to post positions uh, 
even you know to cover things like you know six months or a year just to help someone sort of you know get through these difficult cycles but in general my advice would be to not be shy and to email all the contacts that you have saying you know i'm looking for something i'm willing to take six months i'm willing to take a year you know just so i can get to the next cycle do you know somebody you know it has worked for me and i think this may be a situation in which you know many things are frozen but people may have like shorter uh, pools of money that they can spend how am I able to efficiently manage my time doing work and other commitments? I can't. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think, I think I'm constantly failing. <laughs> but I think one of the advices that I try to go by is, I mean, actually, no, there are two. One is do your creative work always first thing in the morning. So for example, uh, you know, like if you need to advance, you know, if you want to write a paper, you know, do these things like first. Um, and then, you know, like worry about everything else. But actually for me, I think that there are two, uh, I don't know if it always works. So I try to do first the things that would bother me the most if I haven't done tomorrow. Like, you know, the things that is like nagging at me, this is the one that I choose to do first. And then I guess that the other, I think, good advice in organizing your time is to, you know, make a list of what the priorities in your job description are. Make a list of the priorities that you have personally, trying to see how they intersect and then, you know, like try to um, organize your time on the basis of that. Uh, now, I've never been able to work on these things like, you know, like in schedules. Uh, or like, you know, little blocks like many people do, but I try to tell myself, okay, if these are like, you know, the three things I want to get to this week, I try to give them a slot, like as in like, you know, Tuesday morning, I'm going to do this and, you know, like Thursday afternoon, I'm going to do this and Friday morning, I will do this. And then the other thing, like the final things is, you know, again, forgive yourself. This is like, I'm not very good at this, but I feel like, you know, things always take longer than anticipated. This is true for students and this is, I feel like, even more true for us professors. And so I think, you know, as long as you're moving in the right direction, I feel like, you know, it's important also to recognize that um, sometimes things will take longer than expected and, and that's okay. All right. I think probably this is a good time yeah. to Maybe time to stop. So yes. let's all thank uh, thank Viviana again. And uh, um, I don't know if you want to take one more question or not. Or uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, one more. About, it's a question about burnout, and it comes at the end easily real. enough. <laughs> it's very real. I well, I think that the way you can avoid it. I mean, I like I've been in this situation, and even recently, like fairly close. I would say, you know, just briefly that. Uh, the way to avoid it is to know yourself and to know your break in science and to not be afraid to take self-care time before you get to your breaking point right there is nothing unprofessional about recognizing that you are stressed that you are tired that you are overwhelmed but i feel like you know it's much more efficient even just you know for the sake of work to say this is happening you know i'm on the way to this and you know seek help or you know like you know do what you feel like works for you whether it's like you know taking a go a day off to go hiking or you know like talk to your mentor and negotiate like a different schedule or plan or talk to your friends and you know like find the support that you need my only advice is this is it's normal for it to happen but we cannot normalize it Right, it's common, but it doesn't mean that the situation is okay. And so I would, I would say, you know, like don't ignore science that says I'm not comfortable, and try to address it before it becomes like a full burnout, because then it's going to cost you a lot more to recover from it. Okay. Well, let's thank Viviana again. This was wonderful, and I really appreciate this uh, last 15 minutes of uh, taking time. To answer more general questions, we're going to try and schedule one extra um, session that's only about these more general questions. Um, but uh, the complexities of travel being what they are, we don't know everybody's going to be there. So we appreciate you taking time now. Uh, 
Well, thanks again. These were really wonderful lectures. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for attending. And have a wonderful weekend. Ciao. Bye-bye. Okay.